for this edgy escapade and explicit entrance into your elegant and entertaining episode. As an executor, endow me this exercise and exploration in erratic evocation as I elicit and elucidate to you the elephant in the equation. We are in a very sorry era of education and ergo. I must explain this encyclical editorial and eclipse the egotistical enfranchisement of the equitable entourage entrenched and entombed expressly in our extemporaneous excuse of an education system. Before I continue my errors in education, with exception, may I eke out an endorsement of myself? Please call me E. Now, I will elbow in an elaborate encounter with a student, entitled Edward, just on the edge of 18. For ease, we will call him Ed. An energetic, eccentric extrovert of endearing enthusiasm with an enigmatic epigee, of which there is no epigone. His mind emits eloquence equal to the eyes of an eagle, yet erratum elusive in a feat. So tough to extricate energy and errantly enchain effective elements of experience and exemplary ethos in education. That evaded examinations and essays with an ecumenical embargo and evoked erroneous evaluations and encore. Yet, an egg evolved an elan and enjoyment in a certain earthly endeavor. Enter welding. This eruption of epinephrine as earnest endorphins emanated in an engine of equipment in a raptured young Ed. What emerged was a euphoric and emphatic future. As an elder, I was elated, jubilant and ecstatic as Ed expertly earned a new encouraging eternity in employment. But to the education system, Ed was expendable. An enemy in an exile, enclosed and entrapped in an ensnaring euphemism of educational emulsion. Ed was extinguished ambers, eroded with ennui. Efficiently exalted and elevated to emulate empowering emission, yet ethically and exaggeratedly an example of exanimate exception. And he was expelled and expropriated extended at his own expense. And trust me, I am but an envoy of enlightenment to enumerate an environment of edict and elections, echoing edentulous editorials effusing eerie ecocide and ecrine economic embezzlements with an epispastic entropy. This epidemic entails an equiponderate, an epicedium and epilogue of elimination of the enteritis of entangled entrails and an eradication and erasure of excess excrement. An enema. We must excommunicate this excruciating illicit establishment everywhere. Education need not be an ecclesiastical elopement of encryption and enfeeble enchantments. The endemic must end and empathy encumber everyone in our endless enfolding and epic future. Education could easily be the effervescent extension and echelon, enamored and enmeshed in mass with excellence in all elastic emotions and exquisite expeditions. It must exemplify the esoteric exogenesis of extracurricular and extraordinary ecologies. Enacted and encased in an enamel emollient in every esteemed essence, therefore emancipating the enslaved and embroidering our present existence. Escape this eschatology, and evade the Etesian and everlasting epoxy and rooted and enshrined in our evil, exasperating enterprise, and enter into our equinox of exploration and exotic extrinsic explosions with extemporaneous experiments, exulting in our exuberant estuary as we exuviate in an endless and emergent existence. Eventually, we must erect equality among electives and elapse from this exsanguinating extension of exhausting epilepsy. We must exhume this exigent exposure and exhort extreme entrepreneurship and enunciate and do and envelop equilibrium, engendering and engineering education to engross, espouse and engulf all, 
especially those in treating in errant envy elsewhere in educational affluence. The excluded in our excogitated educational system. Education either expands extraordinarily in extravagance and extension, or earth expungeden, therefore editing our Elysium into an expanse of emotionless empery and enmity, erasing the emetic emplacements and enabling the epoch and extermination of expression in our epitome of eponymous epistemology. Johnny was surprised and then he just realized something he thought aloud and he goes oh now I understand the government the president screwing the workforce Congress is fast asleep and nobody cares about the people <laughs> wait a minute what we were off the air why well I'm gonna tell you why we're gonna be spending a little time talking about education um, I've been waiting off and on to do this episode, you guys know that, and I, and I think it's because of the length and the depth that it's going to take. So I'm probably going to split it up into a few parts. Let's just call this part, this one, part one. This one's going to be called Ed. Now to, to catch you guys up on Hillsborough County, uh, someone on my Facebook helped, helped me with the clarification. This isn't a raise. They've been using the word raise off and on on television and the news. Even our kids used it in the protest. But um, it's a contractual step increase. That means it was, it was a promised like, thing for us contractually that every three years we would move up a step. Move up a step. Um, and weirdly, a few years ago, of course, more than three it was probably five. We, as employees, had to either opt in or opt out of this new system. And it was a really big deal because the older teachers, of course, had to look at it and be like, well, why would I ever opt into this? I'm already at the highest rate of the, the, the system you're trying to implement. I might as well just stay on the old, which is actually, in this case, looking much better. Um, but, but the younger teachers, you're talking 20 years and less, this was a no-brainer. We, we definitely had a better situation by opting in. It was, it, it's almost as if they forced us, and that, that's, that's a little tricky. So um, we went for it, but now we get nothing. And we don't just get nothing. So if every three years is one of these steps, this year that we're presently in, we aren't getting the next step, and it doesn't count in those three years. So this is like a no year. This is like we're not even working. We're just getting a paycheck with no future reward whatsoever for this year. And thanks to uh, Miss Dunn, I'm gonna completely call her out, <laughs> uh, for helping me out on Facebook on that one. That is true. This isn't a race. It's not a race. It's not a raise. It was a promised, a promised contractual increase in our pay. So there is one other thing that I want to talk to you about. I can't believe it's another stupid thing. Look, I come up here, I'm all ready, and I forget the one thing I'm supposed to talk about. I did this last week to y'all when I brought up my daughter's onesie, which, by the way, went over really well. Uh, shout out to Miss Henderson. She screenshotted it and shared it on Facebook. Don't talk about me on your show. So I lost my bullhorn. I'm not going to tell you why my bullhorn has been uh, confiscated, but if you're really smart, you'll know why. Anyways, all right. I was recently having to clean out my garage, and I'm the keeper of the family things. I have everything of my family. My wedding ring actually has five, four or five family members' rings all melted into the same one uh, because the family gave them to me. They know that when people pass away, I like nostalgic things and 
I've always kept the family stuff. So sometimes I run across something that I'm interested in. And this one, this one was too perfect. It's dated October 14th, 1978. That's 40 years ago. And it was sent to the Delaware County Daily Times. Now, for those of you who don't know, Delaware County is actually the county of Philadelphia, which is the stupidest thing ever. Yeah, we're next to this state called Delaware, but we're going to call the county that the biggest city in, in Pennsylvania, we're going to call it Delaware County. That makes no sense. But anyways, <clears throat> I apologize, but I'm going to read the entire thing. This letter was written by my grandmother, Ellen Dempsey. Quote, I feel that I've got to voice my opinion concerning the unfair strike at Pendelco School District. Having had a teacher in my family who, by the way, has always been and still is dedicated to her profession, it galls me to see and hear about the unfair things that are going on in that district and township. By the way, this isn't going to be the easiest thing to read, and there's a reason why. Sixty years ago, women were not taught the same as men. They weren't seen as capable of doing the same English. So my grandmother's grammar and diction is not perfect. There's a lesson in that. Quote, Due to the promises of some character-seeking election two years ago, the public were told that there would be no increase in the school tax. He fulfilled this promise. Because of his commitment, the school district went so far in the hole that the school board had to ask the teachers to bail them out and only take a small raise, and in return promised there would be a good raise in the next new contract. The teachers came through for them and said that that would be okay if they had such a problem financially. Two years later, they went back on their commitment, and then they accused the teachers of not wanting to teach. After reading in the papers about the things, after reading in the papers about how things have been handled and the school board at times not even wanting to negotiate, I think it's about time the public hear that it is not just the teachers in the school district that are at fault, but the politicians and members of whom should not even be on a school board. I come from a township where they felt it was necessary in order to have a good education for the children. The taxes were raised and I, for one, did not complain, and my children didn't even attend public schools. Come on, Pendelco, start giving your dedicated teachers a fair deal, and I, for one, am in sympathy for them. I know that Judge Deegan is trying to be fair, but he better keep after that school board because it is sure lacking in intelligence, truth, and cooperation. Teacher's mom, signed Ellen A. Dempsey. My wonderful late grandmother. Forty years ago. Don't you all see this as normal? It's a political tactic. And this tactic's been used all over the country and probably the world. Let's promise something after a tough battle. Economic battle. And then we're going to give them long-term hope. And then when we don't have it, we can prove that we don't have it. And we can give them numbers and see, look, we're broke. We're sorry. And there's no footing for us to argue. Then you might get a lawsuit. And instead of the county paying teachers or whatnot, some insurance company will come in by contract and we might see a little money. But We'll all go back to the table and public schools are failing and so sorry every public school teacher in the United States. This is the argument, guys. It's not being solved because people don't want it solved. And we're going to talk more about that later. I want to turn on to a happier topic. The students. Our students. And I can only speak for Jefferson, but, you know... This last week and the week before its events, have, they've had an outpouring of support for us. I, I've, I haven't heard from some of these students in years. And it's because they saw my present students on television. And it's really put it into perspective. Yes, we teachers will never, and I hope it's known by all of us who teach, we will never be paid fiscally for the amount of work we do. We will not. It's inconceivable for that to be possible. I accept that. The things we do that no one but the kids can see is absolutely unquantifiable. 
And the only people who know and see what we do are the kids. And by the way, they're the only ones who matter. They're the only ones. So I'm going to give a big shout out to some students who supported me. You guys came together, past and present. So to my present students, you've all definitely plowed into this and decided it's something you care about. You've noticed and seen what we do and you foresaw the side effects to you. You saw it. You were paying attention. And, and you noticed the divisiveness in public education. And this degenerating futility that we all know too well what it's like to be left behind and without any future. Which is what public school is going through as we speak. I want to give a, a, a big shout out to Destiny Washington. She was one of our students and she decided for multiple reasons to stage a walkout protest last week. A protest which I had zero input and or discussion with her about. But you all must know that this young lady took it upon herself to make something known in this dire system. That to hurt teachers is to hurt the kids. Yes, her mother is a teacher. Yes, her father is an administrator. And yes, the entire family is in education. And, and that's the point. She's not just affected by the fact that her teachers are going to be hamstrung by this, but that her entire family is fiscally affected. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars in one family. And they're an extremely hardworking family, and they deserve it. So, Destiny, we're really proud of you. You did it for all the right reasons, and you did it so well. And those students like Destiny and Bevan, and then behind, you know, people behind the scenes like Daniel, uh, who see this trend, they're pushing back. They created a movement, and they had hundreds of students behind them. The news showed up with cameras. The helicopter took shots. And not only Jefferson, but she was able to get at least six schools to join her. We're proud of her. Hundreds of our students at Jefferson protested in a way that even if we didn't agree with their goals, which some teachers didn't, which is crazy, but some teachers were against this. As a history teacher, how proud am I that it didn't matter the argument, but they did it perfect. They were civil, they had a clear message, and they showed the county and state what public school is really about, creating educated citizens who promote the state and the country. These students are educated. These students are intelligent, and they know what the future has in store for them. Do not forget about them. Do not ignore them. They matter to you, USA. They see the importance in their futures. Do the rest of you. So I just wanted to tell you all who supported me, past and present, from this school, friends and family who came pouring out on social media, people I haven't heard from in years, uh, shared the post, things like that. I wanted to thank you um, for your support. And even with the movements to not work, there are a lot to cut hours, you know. The union's going to be mad at me, but I can't help it. I will not hurt these kids. I cannot. So at the school board meeting last Tuesday, hundreds of people attended. And it went on for hours. And teachers and parents all voiced their opinions. Some of them extremely rough. Some of the school board members looked as if they might cry. Some decided that they are in the fight fully against us. And against, I think, all of you too. And others looked as if there were actual strings attached to them as they spoke. I want everyone to think for a minute. What do you feel is right here? Really? Do you think this is really about teachers? Don't you see what it's really about? It's about your kid's future. 
And it's not just about your kid's future who go to public school. It's about every kid's future. It's about the quality of the person standing in front of them in that room. It's about care and passion. It's about the future of your child, of that child. My grandmother's kids went to private school and she still understood how important public school was. It's about the future of children, all of them. Point in case. So all of you saw my little intro there. I'm pretty proud of it actually. I used 312 words that started with the letter E. No kidding. But there is a point there I want to start with. It's the part where I said we shall call him Ed. Well, Ed's a real kid and Ed's real name is Enrique. And for legal purposes, Enrique actually agrees with what I'm about to say and has allowed me to talk. He's, Enrique is the student that most teachers would hate to have in class. When he's absent, there is a sigh involved. It's just like, all right, it's going to be a little less stressful today. And he doesn't do any work, and he sometimes, a lot of the times, gets in trouble because of his mouth. And he seemingly doesn't care about school. But if you got to know him, you would see he's most assuredly one of the most intelligent kids in his entire class. He just doesn't see this setting, the schoolroom setting, as his future. At Jefferson, the school I teach at, we have a skill-based magnet program focused on welding. And the students, depending upon what grade they're in, move up and, and, and level up, and hopefully by the time they reach their senior year, they're actually being certified in welding. And when they leave high school, they will already be able to get a job in a professional career in welding. And if they've achieved all these certification requirements, they can apply to be certified. And because of the amazing teachers we've had teaching this program, almost all of them who apply are certified. I had Enrique in his 10th grade year. It's a very rough year for students, especially if they don't think they like school or are good at it. He's an extremely funny kid, but sometimes too inappropriate for school. Get him in trouble. I even spent time on coaching him on comedy, how to keep a notebook and, and write down as many ideas as you could and go back and do it, but that just wasn't for him. So we discussed it. If, if, if I were one of his favorite teachers, which he sometimes would say, why didn't he do my work? And he said, don't, don't take it personal. He, never, he, 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 would, he was never disrespectful. He would just be like, it's not for me. And he would prove it when he took tests. Because he could, if he was there all week and, and heard me teach, just heard me, he would literally get 100% on my test. He is not a stupid kid textbooks and worksheets and all of these hoops, he sees them as useless. They are a waste of his time. Give him something tangible to do. So he, he would love it when I would lecture and talk about the samurai and the knights and, and, and he would still get D's even though he got hundreds on his test because all of the other work just didn't follow suit. Then he finally reached in 10th grade. It was the end of 10th grade. He reached the point where he finally made it through all of the learning process of the welding class and then actually started to get to weld. And he brought in his first weld. I still remember this. He was so excited. He, was, he, was, he had a, a new shine about him. And he came in and he showed it to me. And I don't know a lot about welding, but I have been in that class and I've seen what the kids can do and what they do and how they test their welds. And this weld was perfect. It looked as if a professional had done it. And it was his first weld. And, and this is when I learned from Enrique that he loved welding. He literally came to school and spent the torturous classes all with us who taught bookwork and 
history and math and science. He would, he would suffer through all of that to get to his two periods of welling. And he loved it. And he was good at it. And then there came this time where the school, of course, has different ideas on what success is. Success to the school is his GPA. Two classes aren't enough to keep the seven averaged up afloat. And his GPA was dropping. And they began to threaten him. And the threat for him was, if you don't keep your GPA up, you can't stay at Jefferson. Because this was, a, it was either a choice school. It, it wasn't his first school. He had permission to come here. And yes, and he knew the direness of this GPA. And he tried, and he, and he put in a good few weeks, and it didn't last. He just couldn't. He couldn't keep it. And so he got the threat. He got the, you're going to be, you're going to be sent out. And I know right before summer break, there was this great fear from the school. Grades up or you're out. So when we entered the summer and I shot the video you just saw. I shot it because I was torn. And, and I thought long and hard about what we're actually doing in regards to teaching. Now, I'm not going to condone any of the, the next events in Enrique's life, but he went downhill fast this year. I think that with the ultimatum facing him and the known aspect that he would fail, and if failing meant welding wasn't going to be there, he gave up. He ended up getting arrested, um, and he was removed from our school. And I have to be honest, I have no idea what's going on with Enrique. And a lot of you are probably sitting behind the camera who don't teach saying he had his chance. He could have gotten his grades up. I mean, that is true. But it, it wouldn't have been useful. The grades in science and math and even history, for sure history. It's weird that mine always is like third in usefulness of success, but first in usefulness of making it through the world. But anyways, it's a side note. Uh, we didn't provide him anything. We failed Enrique. He didn't fail. We failed him. Let me say it again. We failed Enrique. If there had been a school focused just on welding, with the other classes, if welding was five periods, just to make basic math, and the other classes were two, but they were menial, meaning, you know, you're not writing essays, you're just learning the basics to get you through a successful life in welding, he would have succeeded. And he would have finished this school and be making more money than me. Now, I want you to think about that. A student that you may have just thought was a failure could have been successful and could have been more fiscally successful than a teacher. Instead of preparing every student for college and the thousands of dollars in debt that some of these students who can't afford it accrue because they're just not good at school, it's not for them. And then have that tough ride for employment because of either the way they look or the way they sound or any number of superficial internal issues that the person hiring them has. He could have been one of the greatest welding students at this metaphoric school. He would have seen a light at the end of his tunnel versus a wall. He would have seen that he had a future. He would have seen what you thought he couldn't. Enrique deserved better. A 10th grader is too young to understand that by overcoming 
a wall, you have to go over it instead of trying to smash through it. He, of course, tried to smash through it and was crushed. I hope you do all right, Enrique, and I'm sorry that we failed you. So on this topic of skills and what we are or aren't providing some of our students, because they do not all need to go to college, that is, first off, it's diluting the college system and their way of, their way of policing it, because they're responding. Colleges are getting an influx of students who aren't ready for college. Their, their response is going to hurt the kids even more. So we have to come up, we have to, we have to see this future. You need schools for people who want to go to college um, and are pushing through. And yes, they should be provided or provided or out. If you're not good at math and science, you should still be able to try. I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to do what you, maybe Europe does and just say you at age 15 are going to this set of schools and you're going to this set of schools. Uh, you can still have the option, but you need to have the other option, which is I'm not doing well in this setting. Find me something over here to give me a skill. And yes, there will still be people that are going to end up in the group on the outside. But think of how many people will be saved by having trade schools. And I'm going to let Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs talk about it. He went to Congress, I think, three times now to testify, to try and get them to listen to his reason. Thanks. Pleasure to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, back in 2011, the Transportation and Commerce Committee invited me to share my thoughts on how to close America's widening skills gap. So I came to this building to talk about a critical part of the solution most often overlooked by politicians and educators. That would be the pressing need for better PR. I talked specifically about the stigmas and stereotypes that dissuade millions of people from exploring thousands of genuine opportunities in the skilled trades and the urgent need to challenge those myths and misconceptions. I pointed out that President Obama's promise of three million shovel-ready jobs sounded great, but I worried that filling those jobs would be challenging, especially in a country where fewer and fewer people aspired to pick up a shovel. I concluded by telling the committee that millions of open positions will remain unfilled until society changes its opinion on the definition of a good job. And then I invited those present to join me in a larger effort to do that very thing. Shortly after my testimony to the committee, the skills gap closed, unemployment plummeted, and America got back to work. I'm kidding. Shortly after my testimony, the skills gap widened, unemployment grew, and society continued to ignore thousands of opportunities that comprise a critical part of our workforce. So a few years later, I was invited back to the Hill to address the Natural Resources Committee and talk more about the causes of our widening skills gap. This time, I focused on the unintended consequences of promoting a four-year degree as the best path for the most people. There was a time when higher education needed a PR campaign, and it got one. Unfortunately, the push for four-year institutions came at the expense of community colleges, trade schools, and apprenticeship programs. Thus, every other educational opportunity began to feel subordinate. Also, the overall push for college coincided with an overall removal of vocational arts from high schools across the country, and the effects of that one-two punch laid the foundation not just for a widening skills gap, but for a level of student debt that's massive, premature, and completely unnecessary. I testified that tuition had soared in part because thousands of well-intended parents and guidance counselors were telling millions of kids, irrespective of their individual skills, that their best hope of success was the most expensive path available. The pressure on kids to borrow money was enormous, and so they did. Consequently, college tuition rose faster than the cost of food, energy, real estate, and health care. I also shared some personal stories with the committee that day, including a run-in with my own guidance counselor 35 years earlier. In 1980, Mr. Dunbar did everything in his power to dissuade me from attending a local community college. I was told outright that a two-year school was beneath my potential. But a four-year school would have been a huge mistake at that point 
In my life, I was 17 years old, I had no money, and I had no idea of what I wanted to do. The local community college offered hundreds of courses in my price range, so that's where I went, and that experience opened doors that I didn't even know existed. But that same experience is precisely what thousands of kids are discouraged from pursuing every single year. I told the committee then that this cookie cutter approach to promoting higher education has led thousands of graduates with expensive degrees from excellent schools, but with no prospects in their chosen field and no way to pay off their student loans. With the universal push for a four-year degree more intense than ever, I argued then that our skills gap is the direct result of a mistaken belief that the best path for the most people is a four-year degree. And I concluded with another appeal to aggressively confront the stigmas and stereotypes that discourage people from entering the trades, along with the challenge to guidance counselors to present a more balanced presentation of educational alternatives beyond high school. After my testimony in 2013, the skills gap closed. Public education re-embraced the vocational arts. College tuition returned to affordable levels, and America finally got back to work. I'm kidding. That was fascinating. <laughs> Shortly after my testimony, the skills gap got even wider, the tuition got even more expensive, and guidance counselors continued to use a career in the trades as a cautionary tale for those who resisted a four-year degree. Now the situation has devolved even further, and my own mother has concluded that I am part of the problem. The more you testify, she said to me last night, the worse things get. <laughs> she may be right. Today, the skills gap is wider than it's ever been. 5.6 million jobs, according to the BLS. Vocational education is still missing from an overwhelming majority of high schools. Bills like the one before this committee still meet resistance in part because millions of Americans still view a career in the trades as some kind of vocational consolation prize. It's a bias, as misguided as any other prejudice with us today, and it poses a clear and present danger to our country's overall economic security. The student loan bubble is going to burst, as bubbles always do. Currently, the outstanding debt is $1.3 trillion. And yet we continue to lend money we don't have to kids who can't pay it back, to teach them jobs that no longer exist, while ignoring all kinds of careers that actually do. Are we really going to leave those out who don't have the best home life or parents or wealth? or those who have a different skin color or language from our society? Is the goal to weed them out? Is, is this truly like de facto education mixed with de facto segregation? Are you trying to hold people down in the country and make it look like it's an accident? Is that your goal, US government? Are you truly that elitist? If so, be honest about it. And when you say we're going to focus on the laurel quartile, can you actually really mean it and not just say it to cover your data ass? Focus on the lower quartile. Give them a route of success. Don't force them with reading classes. And make them, make them take four classes a day that they absolutely hate and aren't good at and remind them for three hours how bad they are at. Give them an out. Does the elitist U.S. government and society really think that letting the lower class fail will help them in any way? Do you really want all the things you say, or are you just shadow boxing with the reality of the fact that helping them means hurting your pockets? So, dear USA, or rather, dear those of you in charge of the USA, is your goal to keep certain populations of your country uneducated and fiscally handcuffed, chained to your policies and your system? Slaves, in essence? Or are they simply your pawns for prisons or wars? There is a history lesson in all of this. Those in power have to remember to keep their people happy.
And the pursuit of happiness is something we're guaranteed. And I know it's a pursuit. But if you think that people like Enrique and people that are in prisons, especially the young people, if you think that they didn't want to be happy, you're a moron. They hit walls. They hit walls in education. They hit walls in access to education. And I, I think you put those walls there. I think they're there for a reason. And, and, and I think that reason is absolutely nefarious and I'm ashamed in you. I'm ashamed for you. And I know it doesn't matter because making money and living in massive mansions and looking at earth as if it were a game of risk versus the millions of people that occupy it well, just don't forget there's millions of people who occupy it. And there's only a few of you.